from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the African Middle East Division. I'm Mary Jane Deeb, I'm chief of the division, and I'm delighted to see you all here for a very special program to celebrate Jewish American Heritage Month. Today we're hosting John Nathan, who, as our flyer points out, is a world famous author of 11 cookbooks. I have my own copy of Cooking Provence, Four Generations of Recipes and Traditions, it's a fabulous book. And Joan is well known to all of us. She has spoken here many times. And today she will be talking about her new book, King Solomon's Table, a culinary exploration of Jewish cooking from around the world. But before that, we always do a little commercial about our division. And as most of you already know, our division is made up of three sections, the African, the Near Eastern, and the Hebraic sections. We're responsible for materials from 78 different countries in the Near East, Central Asia, the Caucasus, as well as from the entire continent of Africa, North and Sub-Sahara. And we're very active in acquiring and developing collections, briefing visitors coming from all the countries of the regions uh, for which we are responsible. Uh, we also invite scholars and experts who have researched and done work in our areas of responsibility, as John Nathan has. And she has been a very frequent user of our collections, which is, which is wonderful. This is why we cherish her as one of our very special patrons. And we do so, so that people get a better insight and a better sense of what those countries are about, what their culture is about what their history is about. This is why we have these experts who make our collections come alive uh, in, in our reading room. And we certainly collect cookbooks. And we have here the expert. We have Connie Carter, who is here with us from the Business Science and Technology, who single-handedly has built this collection of cookbooks from around the world as one of the largest collection of cookbooks in the world on, uh, on cooking. And she's made some of the most wonderful exhibits, displays here at the library, um, always including the book of John Nathan. So, I mean, she's, Joan has been everywhere, not only in our reading room, but in different parts of the library and in our collections. So we're really delighted to have her with us, to have Connie with us, and now to introduce uh, John Nathan, we have our very own Sharon Horowitz, the senior reference librarian in the Hebraic section, who will be doing the introduction. So Sharon. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Jane. Um, good afternoon and welcome to you all. Um, the, my name is Sharon Horowitz, as you heard. I'm a reference librarian in the Hebraic section. Uh, the Hebraic section uh, marks its beginning in 1912 with the receipt of 10,000 Hebrew books and pamphlets whose purchase was made possible by a gift from New York philanthropist Jacob Schiff. Uh, from those humble beginnings, our collections have grown to around 250,000 items in Hebrew, Yiddish, Ladino, Judeo-Persian, and other Hebraic script languages. The Hebraic section also includes an important collection of Gez, Amharic, and Tigrinya, languages of Ethiopia, past and present, uh, two of our missions in this division are to publicize our collections and to bring people into the library. One way we accomplish this second goal is by holding lectures and having programs such as the one we are hosting here today. One item of business before we begin, this event is being videotaped for subsequent broadcasting. There will be a formal question and answer period after the lecture at which the audience is encouraged to ask questions and offer comments, but please be advised, your voice and image may be recorded and later broadcast as part of this event. By participating in the question and answer period, 
you are consenting to the library's possible reproduction and transmission of your remarks. And also, I want to call your attention to a display of international Hebrew cookbooks and some of Joan's cookbooks that are in the, toward the front of the reading room. Please look at them. Uh, they were arranged with the assistance of my colleague, Dr. Ann Brenner. And now, a word about our speaker, King Solomon's Table, a culinary exploration of Jewish cooking from around the world, as you heard, is Joan's 11th cookbook. In it, she shows the global influences on Jewish cuisine and what makes Jewish cooking unique. As one reviewer wrote, wrote the notes accompanying each recipe are as enriching as the dishes themselves. She is a culinary historian and chronicler of Jewish cooks. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the doyen of Jewish cooking, Joan Nathan. Thank you, Sharon. Can you all hear me? Because I sometimes have trouble hearing. Is this, can you hear now? Good, okay. Um, first of all, I want to apologize that I had two books, which I forgot. One was for her, because clearly the publisher didn't send them to her, and the other one was for me. But that's okay, because I can talk without my wonderful book. Um, I love this place. This is the place that I really think of as home uh, in Washington. I spent a lot of time here with my first few books, uh, Jewish, uh, The Jewish Holiday Kitchen. Um, I just spent, I, had, I guess I had more time then, I don't know. Or the, we didn't have the internet, I guess. Um, I spent days and days in the stacks, and in fact, on my birthday every year, I liked. I would go to the stacks. This year, I came to hear Ann Brenner's fabulous talk on Rachel right in this exact room, and it was just a wonderful way to spend a birthday to learn more about Rachel. Um, so this is my eleventh book, and I, I always say that. I don't think I could have written the book that I wrote last without the book for it. So this book is really looking at Jewish food around the world, how it came together. And because it's so popular all of a sudden, I, I kind of think that um, in a way Jewish and Israeli food is trumping politics, that it's way up there. People might not agree with the politics, but they like the food. And I think that really all over the world, people are looking for the new. They're looking for great ethnic food. And that's what we really love so much. And that's why there are so many new, exciting um, res restaurants from all over the world. <clears throat> Thank you for doing this. Um, so. What ha the way that this book started <clears throat> was I had written I had written a proposal for another book, which was to be something on modern Jewish cooking. And I really wasn't that interested in doing it, but I don't think I ever admitted it to myself. So I took a trip to um, India, and I was <clears throat> in... Kochi, which is, you know, Cochin. And I went to a synagogue there, and on the wall it said that um, Jews had been there since the time of King Solomon. And I started thinking, wow, what, since the time of King Solomon? And so I looked at when King Solomon was, which was about 1000 BC, if there was a King Solomon. There are two schools of thought. There's some people who think that he's really a myth and the myth of the one, you know, the wise man and the king, and that really there was no, I mean, I don't see how they can think there was no first temple, but they do. Um, other people think that he was, he did exist, and I'm going to be with those. Anyway, he's a great metaphor for all that's wonderful and somebody who really likes good food. Um, so what I did was I looked, went, went 1000 BC, and I, I went straight to an archaeologist named Eric Klein, who many of you might know from GW. And he said to me, why don't you come with me to an archaeological con uh, conference in Baltimore, which I did. And I met all the leading archaeologists, and they told me 
what they've been finding on food. And everybody told me to read a book by Jean Botero on the oldest cuisine in the world, which I did read. And it was from 1700 BCE. And the book was, the book is on a cuneiform tablet written in Akkadian on four tablets that are all at the Sterling Library at Yale University. And um, the, 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 the tablets had uh, these 44 recipes, but most of them were for huge amounts of food. And they were for the gods, because they were, everybody believed in gods in those days. And, but what was interesting for me, there, there were mostly were stews, there were some breads. Um, you couldn't really tell what the, mes the recipes were. But there was one recipe for, thank you, for a soup, a borscht soup. And um, then there were all these other recipes. And what I was interested in, what the ingredients were. So if you look at the top of the, the cover of the book right there, um, and the, you can see a bread. It's an Ethiopian Sabbath bread. And it's got these little um, seeds on it, nigella seeds. They we're all re discovering now, but these are some of the oldest seeds known to man. Um, then there was sesame seeds. Sesame seeds, if sesame seeds were existing then, it meant that sesame seeds came from China already. And that they, they're the first ground seed oil. So they were ground into oil. I'm assuming. And if they were ground into oil, you can bet that another ingredient that was there was chickpeas, the chickpea that hummus was there. It wasn't as a recipe in this list, but this was a, something that it was a gruel. That's what everybody ate, but it's a gruel with protein. So that people ate that for morning and very often for evening, poor people especially, as they still do in the Middle East. And um, one thing that I've learned since I've worked on the book was that chickpeas have been around for about 12,000 years in the area, so that everybody had hummus, in case you're uh, 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 not aware of the hummus wars. Um, every single country had hummus. And in the, um, the, the proverbs of Gilgamesh, which are from about the same time, and nobody's sure exactly when, but they're certainly a lot earlier than the 1700 BCE cookbook, um, they, they mention chickpea flour. And chickpea flour was what you would have used in the winter. And of course, now everybody's so excited because the, everybody that's gluten-free is suddenly eating chickpea pancakes. And they think that their 19th century um, Italian called farinata, or their um, uh, 19th century French called soca, but they've been around for thousands of years. And so I began to realize a, a few things. First of all, the timeline of Judaism, you know, whether or not it's exact is something else, but also the timeline of foods. Um, there were, I said there were beets, there were Swiss chard, there were, um, di well, there was dill, um, and there were lots of ingredients that, that were used then. And the sesame seeds made me realize, well, the, the, then something else um, that an academic at, um, no, the archivist of the Sterling Library told me was that the plates, the, um, they were blue and white plates from China, the same pattern in China as in Cyprus at that time. So pe the plates were going around. And these blue and white plates also, my, we, we, it's a surmise, but probably is correct. At some point, they were made in, I know they were made in Iraq or in Babylonia. Then they went north and eventually came to Scandinavia, um, where they, to this day, there's blue and white Scandinavian China. But what else went from Babylonia? Cardamom went with it. And so cardamom appears in cakes throughout Scandinavia. 
because I always think that the spices are a byproduct, really, or something easily that you can carry when you're shipping big things. Um, anyway, so I looked at that. Then I realized that about 1,000 BCE, there was this man named Abraham who lived in Ur, which isn't that far away from Babylonia. How many miles? She knows by heart. About 300 miles, I think. Um, anyway, and um, so Abraham, remember he took the idols and broke them. He was a monotheist. And so he went on to the land of Canaan with his people, with his, I, I sort of think he was one of the early communes with his, um, his wife, his cousins, his friends, and they set up they, they moved to Can the land of Canaan, and then we know from the Bible the foods that he found there, which I'm sure he had early on in the land of uh, in, in Babylonia, because this was the Tigris and Euphrates were in the, um, uh, the Fertile Crescent, and there was so much growing there. So he went um, and he found these seven ingredients in the land of Canaan. He found barley, wheat, figs, dates, olives, um, grapes, and pomegranates. Um, in addition, he found chickpeas, he found um, lentils, and he probably found fava beans, although they, well, he would have found them by then. So the, these were things that, basic foods that people had at that time. And um, I also realized that when the, the Jews went, of course, to Egypt, then they came back um, and built the first temple, which was with King Solomon after King David. And the reason that I call the book King Solomon's Table were a number of things. First of all, in the book of Kings, it says that the, the 12 tribes of Israel had to tithe, were tithed um, or had to tithe the king, the King Solomon, with foods and also uh, jewels and stones and peacocks, which they got. I know that was one of the things that they got, and it was written in, from in India that they found them as far east as India. So each month of the year, there was one group that was tithing the king. In addition, King Solomon, who, as we all know, was wise, um, he also certainly had appetites. He had so, uh, uh, 700 wives and 300 concubines. So um, each of these women would have brought with her foods. I mean, there probably were not 700, but anyway, that's why some people think he doesn't exist. You know, it's too many wives. Anyway, but if you go to a, a, Buddhist, a Buddhist temple anywhere in the East, you see the temple or, or the, the kingdom up top, and then in the front, you'll see places for the concubines. And I realized it was a sign of power to have lots of wives and lots of, of concubines. Um, anyway, so to me, King Solomon his wives brought in all the spices, all the different foods, because you would bring that from home, wouldn't you? You would bring what you were familiar with if you were going someplace new. And so there were all kinds of flavors going on at his, um, in, in, in the, at his temple and also at his palace, which was also on the, um, you know, it was on the mount, the temple mount. Um, and I also knew from the Phoenicians that the Jews learned how to use day boats, which were wooden boats, and they would have been young boys, probably. I don't think anybody else would have done this, that would gone, have gone out and have gone as far as India and went, was near, were near India, and they would see all the different foods that were growing right on like the, the, the ginger and the cardamom and the pepper. So they'd see these um, spices that were so valuable and also were transportable, and they would gather them. Some of them would meet women there. They'd marry them, or they'd at least have children with them, and they would stay. Others would leave. In the 12th century, in one of those little villages that I went to, Shenandoah, I think it's called, 
there was a, a synagogue. Well, you can bet that there was an early syn earlier synagogue. And I say that because when I wrote the book of the food of the Jews of France, the one that Mary Jean likes so much, um, when, I, when I wrote that, I realized that there were about 150 Jewish villages, or villages that had Jews, they weren't Jewish villages, in the south of France in the first and second century AD. And these were all um, destroyed. And the only thing that might have been left, and then some of them, would be a, 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 a cemetery stone, or maybe an indentation in stone where a, um, what do you call it, a mezuzah had been. So that things, and, and I know that one person who um, has studied um, Indian history a lot and has used this library a lot, it, at first did not agree with me. And then he said, you know what, you might be right. Because he kept saying, unless you see an example of somebody being there, how, how do you know that they were there? Well, history is a long time. And we're, you know, a lot of these places get floods and all kinds of things. But anyway, and there are one, in, you know, the, there's hints here and there that, that make you realize that, of course, they came there. So that was helpful to me. And then I realized that after the destruction of the first temple, many Jews went to um, went to uh, Babylonia, and they stayed. And so then they went at about that time on the Silk Route to the right. I keep saying the right and the left, but anyway, um, on the Silk Route they went to places like Azerbaijan, to um, Georgia, to just all the way, all the way around, up into Russia, and eventually to Poland. So there's one group that's going around. Then another group went later, um, after the destruction of the Second Temple, through Egypt to Rome, up to um, France, to, in, to in, uh, Italy, to Spain, and then from Spain, they also went east um, in the 14th and 15th century through Alsace-Lorraine to um, Poland and Eastern Europe. So you find a conglomeration of people all over the place. And to me, that was really interesting because it was reflected in the food. So I felt that learning about um, Iraqi food was very, very important. So I went to, uh, I couldn't go to Iraq. And what I like to do is get stories about people and food. So I went to um, London, where I was told the best um, Iraqi cooks are. And I met with a woman named um, Eileen Kalachian, who's way in her 80s. And she showed me how to make macaroons. Macaroons started in Babylonia. Um, uh, Escabesh started there. And you can see through people where it wandered throughout the world. Um, an overnight chicken called tabit started there. And, and people eating, you know, in the, in the, in the ancient world, um, chicken came late as far as being not, there were kinds of chickens, but um, as uh, the, the way that we eat it is, is first of all, it's really late because we have the, remember those broilers? That's from about the 30s, the smaller chickens. Bigger chickens were there, but chickens, hens were not eaten. You would, you would take a hen that stopped laying eggs because that's why you had hens. Then you would slaughter it and eat it. You would not take a young chicken to slaughter and eat it. Um, and the same with the cocks were used for cockfighting. And when they were too old for cockfighting, you would um, make cockovin or something like that. Now, the, and, and the, the rabbis would not allow Jews, but this is much later, to use cocks for fighting. Anyway, um, so it, there, it, it, in the rabbinic literature, it says that in the first century AD, the, um, the rabbis would not let Jews use chickens for cooking because they pecked around and they were dirty. 
but later, of course, they did. But they let them eat them in Babylonia. So you have this dish called tabit. If I had a, a copy of the book, I, I would read this wonderful quote. Is there, can, is the book, their books, right? Just give them the, oh, thank you. Um, so the tabit was, um, it meant an overnight cooked chicken. And I wanted to learn how to make it. So there was this man named Mayer Sofer, who, might, who I'm sure came to this library, who lived in Virginia. And thank you so much. Um, and he said to me, I will, um, I'll show you how to make it. So I went with him to his house. And I went with one of the Israeli ambassador's wives, who wanted to go shopping in Tyson's Corner. And I said, look, we'll learn to make it a chicken recipe and then we'll go to shopping to Bloomingdale's or wherever. So we went to, and she was in her finery, right? So we walk into this man's house and he takes, he says to her, do you know how to sew? <clears throat> and she said yes. And so she, he had skinned the chicken already and she took the, <clears throat> he took the skin of the chicken and he showed her how to make pockets that she could put the rice in. And um, she really gave me a dirty look. But anyway, she, so she was, needless to say, we never got <clears throat> to, on our shopping spree. Um, but we, I learned this really complicated recipe that was cooked overnight. It was delicious. But then I realized, well, wait a minute. People are going to want to make this recipe. There are a lot of quick ways to do it. So that I went to visit Eileen uh, Kalachi, and she showed me how she makes it. Um, and I'll just read to you what I learned from her, which makes ooh, my glasses. Um, are they ready? Does anybody have reader glasses I could just borrow? <laughs> Thank you so much. So, and this is what makes doing the kind of work I do so much fun. On a recent trip to London, I visited Eileen Dangor Kalachi, one of those naturally great cooks who lives in an apartment overlooking Baker Street. Eileen, now in her late 80s, may have left Baghdad in 1975, but the family dishes decorated with rosebuds and fragrant with cinnamon, cloves, nutmeg, cardamom, and turmeric remain in her thoughts and perfume her kitchen. During a delightful day, I learned recipes and listened to stories about Eileen's early life when some 20 people, mostly family, when family meant everything, lived in a big house overlooking the Tigris River. At home, we used the rice my husband's family grew, Eileen told me in her kitchen. The rice often had small stones in it, so we had to clean it before we washed it, then we washed it again, and again. The rice we get today is clean, but we Iraqis still wash it three times and soak it for a few hours. In Baghdad, we only ate fruits and vegetables in season, so we had to make and store what we needed for the whole year. We even made tomato puree for our cooking, she added. In the summer, everybody bought a lot of tomatoes, squeezed the juice out, sieved them to remove the seeds and the outer skin, and put the juice in a big container on the roof of the house and kept it there for a few days in the sun until it became thick. Friday was the day to start tabit. There were no home ovens at that time in Baghdad, so the tabit was cooked on charcoal overnight for Sabbath lunch. On top of the cover, we put eggs in their shelves, then covered it again, she said. On top of everything was a folded blanket to keep the heat. We ate the eggs Saturday morning with tomatoes, onions, and lemon salad, with pickles or with spring onions and parsley. Today, most cooks have learned speedier ways to make tabit than the one I described above. When I make it, I follow some traditional customs, like using fresh spices I grind and cleaning the chicken with a lemon. Also, I make sure to produce enough hakaka, known in Iran as tadig, the prized crust of rust that forms on the bottom of the casserole. So, you know, images like that, you don't get by talking on the phone with people for, to get a recipe. You have to spend a whole day at least because there's a lot that comes out. And I did that with women in Italy, with this woman. I learned a lot of recipes from her and other things that make what you're doing so very, very special. 
Um, and then, and then I realized that that so much of this Iraqi food or Baghdadi food or um, Babylonian food spread throughout the world, even though they had people that came in, the other conquerors. It was such a a strong commercial center that it's when almost till the eighth century. It just was people wanted to live there. It was a fertile region. Um, it was a crossroads. And the Jews started something called the Radenites. And the Radenites were a, a, a group of um, traders that went as far as Russia, as far as China, and they were a network of, of people that would, um, of, of merchants that would start with food, with buying like spices, they'd buy gems, they'd buy, I heard they bought fish. Um, I don't know how they carried live fish, but supposedly they did. Um, all the way around the world with, and it was in a way like a relay race. And the, the known verbiage, of course, the known language was Hebrew. But um, they're of they were not the only groups, of course. I'm just talking about one group. This, what I'm saying could be said about a lot of different re of peoples within that region. Um, but, but there was one thing that made them different from everybody else, and that was their, their food and their laws of religion. So for me, there are three different ways of defining, um, or three characteristics of Jewish food. One of them, of course, is the dietary laws. No question about that. Even if in the back of your mind you don't believe in the dietary laws, it's still there. And, and all, the, the, all the laws of Judaism are still there. Um, so that's number one. And also this obsessiveness about food. I mean, it, it, believe me, it is. Um, but I guess we're all obsessed about food. So then the, the second one is this merchant part of Judaism, that just as they looked for ingredients in India in those ancient times, Jews have always been merchants and have always been looking for the new. Maybe for the new for themselves, the new, they've been, always been merchants. And that, you can trace that all over the world. Um, you know, they were the first ones to think of futures in the sense that um, if, if you buy grain when it's, it's first harvested and you hold it, when you buy it when it's first harvested, there's a lot of grain, right? Um, if you hold it to the winter, there's not so much grain so that you can raise the prices. And th that's what a, a lot of people in the stock exchange learned from, from, from Jewish merchants, that this is the way things had to go. Um, the, I, I just, the, there are bakers, there's a disproportionate number of bakers within Jewish communities. Because, and just even look in Washington today, Mark Furstenberg at um, Bread First, um, and, and, and cooks, there are a lot of Jewish chefs too right now, but I have a, a theory about that, which I'll tell you later. Um, anyway, so that the second one was the merchant and the interest in food. The third is the fact that Jews were kicked out of so many places, so they had to adapt their cuisine to different regions always. And I think some of you are nodding your heads. I'm sure that Indians and Lebanese and all kinds of Chinese have also had to adapt theirs. But the point is that you want to have the, 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 the food is comfort, and you want to have this table-centered religion as comfort with the foods that you grew up with. And so I'll give you an example. I was, for the book, I went to El Salvador to interview the 100 people in the um, Jewish community of El Salvador. And there was this one woman, uh, and they all made food for me for Friday night dinner. And um, a woman made yucca latkes with cilantro cream. Well, yucca is easier to get in El Salvador than potatoes. And so that's what she used. And you know, and you find that over and over again. I found escabeche, which is um, a fried and 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 marinated fish, um, in Jamaica. And what did they serve it with? Scotch bonnet peppers, because and also allspice. Now allspice too. So what I did in this book was I I took the the timeline of Jewish history, and I tried to. Co C combine it with ingredients. So when I went to Spain and then I went to the New World, I realized a few things. First of all, 
the 1492 being the time when the Jews had to get out of Spain, it was no coincidence that uh, Christopher Columbus had his um, boat that started in 1492 because for the eight years prior to that, all the boats were rented for Jews that wanted to get out. They had a big, uh, they were like 250,000 Jews in Spain and they had a deadline so they got out. When Christopher Columbus boats went, there were certainly Jews that were on the boats and that stayed in the New World. And then they brought back, or else other people brought back, two Jews that were called Turkish merchants. They were originally Sephardic merchants, but they didn't want to be called Sephardic because they knew they were being kicked out of Spain. They were also Portuguese, they were called in French, Marchand Portuguese, and they were Portuguese merchants that were also taking these ingredients and bringing them to places. Well, first of all, they, they came to Naples, which was a Spanish port, but then they, they went like corn, um, peppers, uh, tomatoes, and I forget what other one, potatoes went to um, places like Bulgaria and Hungary, always by the so-called Turkish merchants. And this was a fertile area of the, the Danube River, so they planted them. Most of those things were used for fodder at the beginning. And then eventually, like Jerusalem artichokes, people liked using them. But the potatoes, the, they were just grown for farms, that's it, not to eat. And even when my father, who came from Germany in 1929, when he came to the United States and there was all this good corn, he wouldn't eat it. He said, that's just for animals. So I guess in southern Germany, they didn't have really good corn then. Um, so I, I realized, that, and the other thing that I realized in the centuries before um, where foods went, where foods went were very easy for me to figure out their roots, because you, you can see um, there's a lot written on it, and, um, but it's really interesting to, tra to trace it, and you'll see it in my book. Um, but the other thing that was a big, big help to me, and I'm doing all this academic stuff because this is the Library of Congress, is um, was the Geniza in Cambridge. So I went there, and I was really lucky because Ben... Wright, who was the um, archivist, spent a lot of time with me telling me about the ephemera. Do you know, does everybody here know what the Geniza is? Is this, you do or you don't? Okay. So a, a Geniza were, uh, was like a treasure tress, chest of, of documents. Um, they say they were in Christian churches and mosques and in synagogues, and they, they're lost documents of ephemera, mostly, but they're supposed to keep everything that was written on sheepskin or paper with the name of God in it. And um, they found one of these treasured trusts in the Cai uh, Cairo synagogue in about the end of the 19th century. And I mean, it's, it, there's a wonderful book called Sacred Trash that if any of you want to read, you'll read about the, it's, it's a, a wonderful detective story about how all this stuff was found and then how you read about different people. And there were letters so that I learned, for example, that there was a, remember I said that there's like a relay race from Aden to Cairo, or it was called Fustat, um, which is part of Cairo today. Um, and then some went to Ceylon, these boats, and, and the, the, a lot of the heads of the boats would write these letters. And they would say, write one letter to another merchant saying, I slipped in some turmeric and other spices so that the, um, uh, so you wouldn't have to pay tariff on them. And you knew that these were for men for, you know, the, the um, for virility. And it's really interesting to see what 
went on, just in what they wrote. And this was a way of endearing one merchant to another merchant. Or there was um, wheat sent to a community in Aden because they didn't have wheat at the time. And uh, you know, you're supposed to make a wheat Hala on Friday night. So you got senses, or one I have in my book, a woman who was a lousy cook, and her husband went out. And this is what you, you learned as, as, as what people did. Um, he had the shopping list, because a lot of the women were kept in, um, they were in their courtyards or at home. They didn't go out. And it was a way of the man saying, look, I made the money. So he would go out like on a Wednesday because it was you wanted to have food for Shabbat. He'd go, when he got his paycheck, if it was Wednesday or Thursday, he'd come after work, go to the market. And you can see it like in Machane Yehuda in Jerusalem today. Um, he'd go there, he'd buy the ingredients that she said, and he'd bring them home. So he had this one recipe, this man, who wrote a lot about his wife being a terrible wife. But my editor made me take it out. I don't know why. Anyway, so, um, but she could cook. So he, um, he had this one less recipe for Shavuot, one hen for the Sabbath, eggplant, and some other things. So I looked in old books because I realized that most things, you know, that people didn't have different, like a, 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 a vegetable on one side, and that came later. They would have a stew, pretty much. That's what you would have for your dishes. Or, you know, a stew like a, 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 like a couscous, where you'd have rice and you'd have, anyway. So I, I looked in old, old cookbooks for chicken with eggplant, and I had never known that as a Sabbath dish. And there it was in all of these um, uh, uh, Iraqi cookbooks and also different Sephardic cookbooks. And you realize a lot of the people that came to Spain came through Iraq. So that, and, and I'm convinced that they went back to Iraq maybe after 400 years because they still, when they were kicked out of Spain, when they still had res uh, relatives there, and then they went around the world. So, you know, into, and then they went to um, India, because I met this woman named Qu Queenie Halegua in, um, uh, in uh, Kochi, and she invited me for dinner, and she kept talking about pastel, and, her, and I thought, wait a minute, this woman is not Sephardic. She's really Iraqi. And her son said the same thing. He said, I think that our family was in Spain. They came back, but she liked that pastel, which is like a, um, a, a pastry filled with things. So, oh, there are many different kinds of pastels. And then brought it back to, to it, it comes in families, right? These words and these recipes. The, uh, the other thing is there's no, in the Geniza, there are no recipes. There are shopping lists. And then there are prescriptions from doctors. Like Maimonides would have written, you need this, you need chicken and chicken soup. And so they would talk about different ingredients um, that you would need. So the, the Geniza is really interesting. Um, so please read that. So, and then of course, food has changed tremendously today. And that's because of the, um, the world of, from the 1850s on, where we have all this rich food and the processed food. The, the age of industrialization changed everything and changed it very quickly. I'm convinced that in the ancient world, it took a lot longer time to change for food change. For us, it's within weeks. We've got um, email, we have uh, radio, TV, cook. How many cookbooks do we have? But it used to be that you would learn it from your mother, from your family. In a way, it was like the closed communities of today, but just family units. And that's, and, and people would, um, in different countries, got, guard their foods so preciously um, within the community. And, ooh, I've gone way beyond, beyond my speak. Okay, so um, you can look at my book. I hope you will like it. It's got recipes from all over the world, and um, and I've gone to a lot of places to get these recipes. Uh, I've got, and I'd love to see if any of you have any questions because we can then I can answer 
talking about some of my recipes. Tamar, you better ask about your mom, your, your father. My father? Yeah. Okay, so that, yeah, well, that's in my book, that recipe from your, okay, so what she asked is the pastel that her father talked about was different from what I'm saying. A pastel could be a pie, a meat pie, and Tamar's sister, she's um, related to my husband, but her sister gave me two amazing recipes from the family, and one of them, I mean, her father's family thinks that they came, their direct descendants, I hate to tell you, a lot of people think that, of King David. So um, she has a chalant recipe that is so good, that is so wonderful, that you can see that it went um, to the Balkans. It came from Spain up to the Balkans, to, the, uh, to New York, and now her, her sister's living in Israel. So it, and, and oh, and to Italy, she lived in Italy. So it picks up things like her kids like hot dogs, hot dogs are in it. She's got eggplant because they lived in Bulgaria, eggplant is in it. And these, that's what's wonderful about recipes. Um, the, the pastel that she has, which is really delicious, I'm telling you, it's got eggplant and meat and ground beef and I think tomato. And you make it, I make it with puff pastry. I think that's what she said to do. Oh, no, 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 I do not make it with puff pastry. I tell you, you can. It's a really easy pastry. And then you put it on the bottom, put this in, you know, and then cover it. Delicious. Um, everybody loved it when I made it. So it's one of the great recipes of the book. Any questions? Other? Hi. Okay, well, th this is a really good question. What spices or what ways of preserving things? Well, the, the ways were, you know, very, very old. Um, salting was the, the, the primary, and that's why salt, in a way, was so precious. Um, you could salt fish, you could salt vegetables. You could, vegetables, though, the best way to preserve was in the sun. And just the way they took these tomatoes and put them on the roof. And they do that to this day. I, I was in a little village in Galilee, an Arab village in Galilee, and they were drying their wheat on the top of the, um, for bulgur, on the top of roofs. So that, you know, that's, um, and then of course, salting fish, um, salting fish, but also putting it in vinegar. A lot of vegetables were either dried or the Italian Jews, for example, would, they would pickle their um, zucchini, but, but Turkish Jews would salt it. I mean, dry, excuse me, dry it, and then I'm, I'm sure you've seen eggplant and zucchini put on long um, strings. So there, there were different ways, and, and this was so important. Um, f uh, the Bedouins, to this day, still salt their um, yogurt to make it into fish. I mean, excuse me, to make it into cheese. So it's very dry, and, and it's very salty. So you dehydrate it, and it won't be as salty, and you can use it in the winter as cheese. Um, yeah, so... And then, then as far as um, spices, I'll, I'll tell you this. I think it's an interesting story. Um, the spice, all spice, was from is from Jamaica. So, I think that all spice came to England. Was called English pepper, and there was another ingredient um, called kubeb, which was a little bit like all spice, a little bit like pepper, a little bit grainier. And that was used until allspice, which is very much used in the Middle East, came down to Babylonia from, or to Baghdad, from um, England, and it just wiped it out. No one uses kubeb anymore. But I, I, 
I have a feeling Kubeb might, be, it's like a berry. Um, it might be Sancho pepper, and I'm not sure. Anyway, but so that things change. Yeah, yes. When did what? Oh, well, I mean, it came in late. You know, it was used, like iron was used first. That was used very early, probably, I don't know, 12th century, maybe earlier. Um, but a lot of metal came at the age of industrialization. You know, we were this last summer, my husband and I went, um, to uh, uh, where was it? Marquette, Michigan. Have any of you ever been there? And there's this huge iron ore, um, it's like an elevated iron ore, I don't know what it is, to load the iron ore. It, it's maybe 30, it's, high, it's as high as this, as this ceiling. And you load it, you, you, they would come in trains. The trains would go up to the top, and they load the iron ore, little pellets that they made. And I realized that this makes this, and they would go down to Benton Harbor to make all the steel that we use. And I realized how really um, late processed all this stuff was. It was just people making it till then. But it was, you know, I mean, individuals making it. And um, the age of industrialization just changed everything. Yeah. How many countries are represented in, in the book as far as recipes from different countries? Um, how many recipe, how many countries? Well, there are, I think, about 30 to 40 different countries re represented in the book. And I could have now, now that I'm speaking around the country, I've learned that Azerbaijani, uh, all these people, I mean, Azerbaijan is in the book, but people are coming to me with lots and lots of recipes. Um, they're coming to me, oh, they said Haiti, there's, a, there's a, a, a group of Jews that lives in Haiti. So I'm gonna ask Jose Andres if I can go with him to, to, to find these Jews. I mean, you know, I'm, it's so interesting. I mean, I always thought that writing these books I would be bored after a while. I'm never bored, it's just, you know, I get all these letters about, I, I drive Sharon crazy because I want to find out if a, a Yiddish recipe, we can find it here that I can't find in any of my books. But, you know, and, and, and at the Library of Congress, I learned so many things. Um, for example, I, I forget, who, who was the man that knew so much about the collection who passed away um, of the... What? Myron Weinstein was one, but there was this other person. No. Anyway, but Myron would know. For example, um, sauce portuguese. Whenever you use a, 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 a Portuguese sauce in, a, in the early cookbooks, it meant that it was a tomato sauce and that it was a Jewish tomato sauce because, again, these Portuguese merchants. And... Um, and I'll tell you one quick story about the, the Portuguese merchants. They, they, they were very, there was always somebody who was a doctor in the family, in these Portuguese families. And there was one doctor named John de Sequeira, who I spent a lot of time in the Library of Congress before everything was digitalized, looking him up and learning about him. And he was the earliest, the only Jew living in, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Williamsburg, Virginia at the time of Jefferson. And you, you can see a winter tour, some of his a painting of him, and, and somebody wrote on the back, he introduced tomatoes to Virginia. And there's this, I think, apocryphal story that he was with Thomas Jefferson, and um, they were in Petersburg, Virginia, and Thomas Jefferson started eating a tomato because it was a member of the Nightshade family, right? and so. And everyone thought that they were just to look pretty. 
and he bit into it and everyone went, <gasps> and of course he didn't die, so people started eating tomatoes. I don't, I mean, I've heard that story from a lot of different towns, so I'm not sure if it's true or not, but I like the story. Anyway, but he really introduced them because he knew, because he was a, a, a scientist and because he had the, the experience of being a Jew and eating these things, again, within his insular family in London, and it was a well-known family, but he, did, he never married. He started the Wine Society in Williamsburg. His house, you can still see it where he lived. You know, it, it sounds like he was a quiet man. I'd love to learn more about him. If any, any of you, you know more about him? No. Okay, another question. Ah, oh, good, good question. What's my theory about why there's so many Jewish refs? Okay, in 1968, there was a chef was a blue collar worker. So remember Paul Prudhomme and this guy Louis Sotmary from the bakery in Chicago? They lobbied to change the assignation of chef from blue collar worker to white collar worker which they did in 1968. And it took a while, you know. And all I could think of when that happened, especially now when there are so many Jewish chefs, is that Jewish mothers at that time wanted their sons to go to be a doctor or a lawyer. But now being a chef has a lot of prestige. So they were, I mean, I'm sort of being ludicrous about this, but I think in a way, it's, it's, an, an, it's a respected career. And um, there are more and more and more, and I'm just amazed at it, actually. And also, the reception of Jewish food. You know, when I was very young, it wasn't so popular. Anyway, is there one more question, or, okay. Oh, okay. Did I make, notice a big difference between um, Ashkenazic, Sephardic, and Mizrahi? Mizrahi means, in a way, everything else. So Sephardic would mean if, if a Jew went to Spain, but if, if a Jew is, still can be Iraqi. I, in my book, I try not to use the words Sephardic and Ashkenazi because I think, in a way, it's irrelevant. It's sort of where each family journeyed. So I did find lots, I mean, I, for sure, more than in any other book, because I went to, I, I, didn't, I didn't always have to go to places. For example, there are a lot of Azerbaijani Jews now in Brooklyn, and there are Uzbeki Jews in Brooklyn with really good food. If you go to the families, um, and, and other places around the, the country. So all I had to, uh, or Iranian food in um, LA. So I went there rather than traveling around the world. But I got some great, end to end by the way, and in Israel I got a lot of great recipes. Bulgaria, or you can get in uh, Libyan food, for example, which is, would go with the Mizrahi. You get that in, in Rome and in, and in Israel. And, you, and you, that's one of the cuisines that's going to really be gone because there's no, there are no Jews anymore in Libya. There are no Jews in, in Iraq. So with all the intermarriage between different kinds of Jews and between Jews and non-Jews, a, 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 a wonderful cuisine like Libyan food is harder to make. And a, it, it's going to go by the wayside unless people like me try to capture it. But I really, and, and what I did, when I try to do... When I'm testing recipes, I test them like on a Friday or Thursday and Friday, like maybe six or seven recipes, and then I invite people for Shabbat dinner, and then they um, the, they give and I some of them I really trust because they'll be honest with me, and and I think would I ever want to make this again because you I'm writing a cookbook for people, and if you don't want to write it, you don't want to make that recipe again, then forget it. So that's what I do, and it, it really works for me. Some people send out the recipes, but I like having a connection the, to my books and to, you know, what's in the books and, and, and make it part of our, my life. Because I can, you know, you can always tell the stories that go behind all these recipes. So thank you very much. All right. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. 
visit us at loc.gov.